section I should be talking about shooting stars and space rocks. So let's begin. So most meteors that we see streaking across the sky are tiny, the size of a grain of sand. Larger ones though can be visible as uh, fireballs, a uh, great big flash, like in the picture here shown over the top of the radio telescopes of the VLT. And sometimes those are even bright enough to be visible in broad daylight. I remember seeing one in the 1970s that came over at about three o'clock in the afternoon in, against a bright blue sky. And I could even hear the uh, supersonic shockwave of it as it went overhead. But uh, we get hit, if the Earth gets hit, by millions of these meteors falling in from outer space each day. And it works out about 100 tonnes a day, which is about 36,000 tonnes every year, if you work it out, so day in, day out. Now, most of them, of course, land in the ocean, uh, there being 70% of the surface area of the Earth covered in water, but of course, many of the uh, remainder land on Earth, and those are the ones that we generally manage to pick up um, and uh, collect as meteorites. The source of them, well, a lot of them is from the asteroid belt. They're uh, an artist rendition of the asteroid belt here. It's actually a lot more sparse than this picture gives the impression of. But nevertheless, gravitational influence of one object orbiting around in this gap between Mars and Jupiter on another, an occasional near miss or even a collision, or sometimes just the perturbing effects of the combined gravity of all the other planets can swing them out of their orbits and send them plummeting in towards the inner solar system and coming our way. And eventually they might collide with something. They might collide with the sun, be destroyed that way, or they might hit one of the planets or the moon, or they could get deflected outwards into the outer solar system. All these possible scattering trajectories can happen. But sometimes they come our way and they come in through the Earth's atmosphere at quite high speed, and that can vary depending on the trajectory and whether it's a head-on collision with the Earth or a uh, glancing blow. And it can be anything from 18 to about 70 kilometers per second. Now, when they do come into the Earth's atmosphere at such high speeds, they get heated for a short period of time. They get intense heating. Um, and that's what we see in the sky as the glow. We see the uh, very uh, powerful glow across the sky. That's the, actually the air being ionized. So most of the light is coming from the air glow created by the uh, heating of the air by the meteorite. Once they make it to the ground, they're called meteorites. They should be called meteors when they're in the sky still. Meteorites, once they're actually on the ground. And quite a lot of them are these iron type meteorites. We call them just plain irons, but they're mixtures of different metals, usually a lot of iron and nickel. It's very common as well. Quite high density being solid metal and they have this uh, carved pockmarked surface where lighter material that was embedded and mixed in with the iron has been burned away during the fall, during that time of severe heating as it came in through the atmosphere the heat has stripped away all the volatile materials and left the big holes in the uh, surface. So very characteristic. Also, when you cut them open and uh, do a special acid treatment, it reveals a crystal structure inside the meteors, meteorites, called a Widmanstatin pattern. And what these are, these strange, uh, features that we see are very very large metal crystals and we don't see this except in this meteoric iron. It's not seen in iron from 
uh, forges or blast furnaces, they have crystals, but they're microscopic, absolutely tiny. Whereas in meteors, they're very large indeed. And so uh, one of the best ways to tell if something is a meteorite or not is to cut it open and have a look for these crystals. If you find the Vidman Staten pattern like this, then it's a sure thing that that is uh, a, a meteorite. But of course, we also get uh, stony meteorites made of grains of silicate uh, rock of various types. And some of these are called crondites, which contain these very special silicon grains that have not been melted since the dawn of the solar system. So they're 4.55 billion years old, just a fraction older than the Earth itself. We're, we're dating things by the time since last melting. <clears throat> and so these are bits of the very early solar system that were left over and never melted and have eventually found their way to Earth. We also find other types of stony meteorites called achondrites. And these don't have the same little silicon grains in them. They have an entirely different structure that shows much more recent melting, by which I mean in the last few hundred million years rather than four and a half billion. So they're much younger aged by that method. And then we find curious mixtures of stone and iron, unimaginatively called the stony irons. And a classic example of those are called the palisites. And they have a mixture of stony rocky grains trapped in a metal matrix as shown in this marvelous thin section photograph here. So what's going on? Well, as with a lot of things in astronomy, we see the after effects. And what we have to do is try and piece together the storyboard of what has happened. And so the solution to this puzzle goes like this. The metal meteorites with the uh, surface, carved surface and the Vidman Staten crystals are the cause of destroyed baby planets or planetoids. Lots of these were formed and in the process of forming during the early part of the history of the solar system, probably hundreds of small planetoids growing by accreting other smaller objects to them by gravity. But every now and again, there would be a very violent collision between one growing planetoid and another. And they, if that was a head on collision or a very violent one, at least it could destroy the planetoids. These objects would have been anything from 200, 300 uh, uh, kilometers across or larger and large enough that the heat trapped within the core from all the accretion and from radioactivity would have melted the inner core of the planetoid and allowed the heavy metals to sink to, down into the core and the lighter rocky layers to float over the top. And so when we pick up a metal meteorite. It's come from the core of a destroyed planetoid. For the stony meteorites, the chondrites, the small space rocks that never got formed into the part of a significantly large object, never large enough to have melted its core and therefore never melted the uh, grains within the chondrite. So those are limited to being parts of fairly small objects up to a few tens of kilometers across, maybe 50 at most, but not large enough to have ever undergone melting. Whereas the achondrites are the crust layer of the small planetoids that melted in the original period and then perhaps cr crusted over, solidified around the molten core of the baby planetoid but were shattered and scattered all over the solar system in a violent planetoid on planetoid collision. And the palisites, the stony ions, well the theory goes that uh, these are probably 
the uh, from the layer inside the planetoid at the boundary between the rocky outer layers and the inner uh, iron and metal layers and so they show the melting but they're still a mixed uh, composition with this metal matrix containing uh, rocky grains. And this is all evidence of what a violent place the early solar system was. So I'll just summarize that in one more uh, chart here. The carbonaceous crondites from the very early part of the uh, solar system may have got together to form small space rocks, primitive planetesimals, but not large enough to have uh, trapped enough uh, radioactive material and enough heat to have melted and undergone what's called differentiation. But the largest ones, the size of a couple of hundred uh, kilometers and, and larger, uh, were able to melt and differentiate their layers with the densest material sinking to the bottom. And uh, some of those still exist in the asteroid belt like Ceres and Vesta, the surviving members of that planetoid um, population, whereas uh, a lot of them got destroyed and the material would have been recycled, although some of the fragments are still flying around today. So that's really tells us why we get the different types of meteorites. Now one thing that's often said is that uh, when you uh, have a meteorite land you mustn't pick it up because it will be red hot. Um, I mean it's after all come through the atmosphere streaking in at uh, hypersonic speed, cause the air to reach thousands of degrees and glow and so it, you know, there's tales of them coming in, setting fire to the trees as they land, um, people burning themselves on them. And uh, this particular photograph was uh, published a couple of years ago in the summer um, mm -hmm. and uh, says red hot meteor from outer space lands in back garden of Yorkshire. Oh, sorry, sorry. Scorches man's lawn. So, is this true? Well, no, it isn't actually. It can't be because as they streak across the sky, they do indeed get heated up, but that, that only affects the outer crust of the meteor and the deep core of it has been in millions of years out in deep space at minus 250 degrees. And so the bulk of the meteor is still very, very cold. And that superheating period lasts less than a tenth of a second and it's enough to heat the outer layer but not enough to bring the temperature of the overall mass of the object up at all. And of course once they've slowed down they stop glowing in the sky but that's not the end of the story because they then still fall from several hundred thousand feet through the very cold parts of the atmosphere at minus 60 and the surface cools down again very quickly, soon radiates the heat away. Um, meanwhile, of course, the heat is still, uh, well, the temperature is still minus 250 in the middle. So when they hit the ground, you're, if you pick one up, you're more likely to get frostbite than a burn. I suppose that can feel the same. But this picture, I would put it to the jury that this is next door's barbecue that has been thrown over the fence once finished with and enter into evidence the cigarette butt that is present. So uh, I think that probably explains that particular phenomenon. It looks nothing like a meteorite. Of course they do fall to earth and we do find the smoking craters. This is uh, the uh, remains of one that fell 50,000 years ago in Arizona. It's called Meteor Crater or Barringer Crater. You can see the road and the visitor's center in the photograph there gives you some idea of the scale of it. It's uh, just over one kilometre in diameter and 150 metres deep and the object that hit was probably around 50 metres in diameter. Uh, came into the Earth's atmosphere and was somewhat slowed but still doing 12 kilometres per second when it hit the ground and released energy equivalent of a fairly large hydrogen bomb at about 10 megatons. So a fairly substantial crater. Now Mr. Barringer who bought the land and the crater with it 
went drilling right down in the center. You can see some of the workings down there in zoomed in photographs, trying to make himself a fortune by pulling out the large lump of meteoric iron. Unfortunately, with a hyper velocity impact like this, the meteor is almost completely disrupted and destroyed and vaporized and fragments blown all over the place. And none of it is in the hole in the ground. So I'm afraid he drilled and lost all his money. He failed to find anything. Now we do have other impact craters on the Earth. There's a few interesting ones here. Some filled with water, others down in the deserts of South Africa, on the bottom right there. And the more we've looked, the more of these craters we've found across the uh, countryside. I can hear somebody talking in the background. If they could mute themselves, please. Um, so, the question really is, does anyone ever get hit by one of these falling space rocks? And the answer is occasionally yes. This is the story of Mrs. Anne Hodges. She was struck by a meteorite on 30th of November 1954 at her rented apartment in uh, Alabama. An object crashed through the roof, smashed the radio that she was listening to, and bounced across and hit her on the side. You can see the doctor in the bow tie there examining uh, this massive bruise that she got. It's very lucky not to be hit directly. Um, now the story goes that uh, oh, well, on the left there we've got the mayor and the chief of police examining the meteorite. You can see it in the, uh, the hand there. It's quite a large object actually. Um, you wouldn't want that hitting you at a couple of hundred miles an hour. Um, now, she tried to sell the meteorite, but she got into an enormous legal dispute between the uh, landlord who owned the house, um, and there was a, a lot of money spent, in fact, um, on lawyers arguing about whether the meteorite belonged to Mrs. Hodges or to the landlord. And in fact, I think the only people to make any money at all were the lawyers. Contrast with the Peekskill meteorite, which uh, fell out of the sky and broke up very spectacularly, was captured in that photograph there. And a fragment of it, shown at the top left, hit Michelle Knapp's Chevy Malibu. Um, she picked it up and said, in surprise, it was barely warm. Well, of course, we know it should be cold, in fact. But the uh, damage to the car is also shown there along with its proud Japanese owner who bought it from Michel and took it on a world tour. Now the car in those days cost her the princely sum of $300. And she thought that it was written off when it was destroyed by this meteorite, but she sold the car for 10,000 and the meteorite itself for $69,000, which in those days was a terrific amount of money. So if you do, uh, have an incident like this, do pick up and keep the, the meteor and anything it destroys um, and make sure that you uh, sell it. Now famously about seven years ago now the Chelyabinsk event happened with an object coming into the Earth's atmosphere and air bursting high in the uh, sky. Came in at 41,000 miles an hour out of the direction of the Sun, no one saw anything coming it blew up but was captured on lots of people's dash cams in Russia and they're from their uh, cam cameras mounted on the dashboard of their cars and it uh, did a certain amount of damage it blew out a lot of windows and a few people were injured by flying glass uh, one teacher made all her pupils duck under the desk uh, when she saw the flash and uh, very wisely so but then she stayed, went and stood by the window so she was sadly uh, rather hurt by the flying glass, but no one was actually killed. But the explosion was uh, seen and photographed over a huge area. It was about half a megaton of TNT equivalent, so a fairly substantial explosion. And the object was around 20 meters in diameter, weighing about 15,000 tons, they estimated. Now it uh, came to earth, and landed in lots of fragments. There's a little fragment on the snow there, 
and one particularly large one punched a hole in the ice on a frozen lake in the uh, vicinity and they sent down divers and put a harness around it and pulled it up and you can see it's quite a big chunk of uh, meteorite there so uh, we've uh, got quite a lot of bits of this object and the the idea was that it uh, was probably a dirty snowball so more like a comet and that's probably why it blew up and fragmented high up in the uh, atmosphere rather than making it all the way to the ground in one piece Now there is another type of object that we uh, see land on the earth and these are rather strange objects called tektites and in the 1960s they were believed to be bits of the moon after impacts had struck the moon they would have uh, blasted fragments out into the translunar space between the earth and the moon and earth's gravity pulled the uh, droplets of molten material uh, down towards us and it would have solidified and then fallen in out from outer space was the idea um, and be bits of molten glass from the uh, lunar material but in fact it turns out most of them at least are bits of the earth where impacts on the earth have ejected molten glass material to great heights out of the atmosphere and then it's rained back down on other parts of the earth and uh, many have been identified and now linked to impact craters on the earth using isotope analysis to date and match up the, the uh, compositions for different parts of the earth but we do have a few bits of uh, other celestial objects we have meteorites from the moon itself that really have been blasted off the moon and then landed here this is ALH 81005 a piece of the moon and we've only really were able to identify this after moon rocks were brought back from the Apollo missions and, and analyzed from an isotope point of view and a radioactive signature point of view and were able to be matched up to the signature of these rocks that we found uh, in uh, Antarctica and it's we're able to figure out even from the cosmic ray signature in the outer layers of the uh, object compared to the center that it was probably in transit from the moon to the earth for about 20 million years out in space we've also got meteorites from Mars about a hundred of them and we know they're from Mars because you can do analysis on them and find little bubbles of trapped gas which you can then put through a mass spectrometer and work out the isotope signature of the molecules that you have there and that matches perfectly with the same experiment done on the Martian atmosphere by the uh, rovers that have these little uh, chemical laboratories on board so the chemical and isotope signature of the Martian atmosphere is replicated in the little bubbles of trapped gas and this particular one is another one found in the Allen Hills area of Antarctica ALH for Allen Hills 84001 and it's a very very famous meteorite it uh, was the subject of a release a press release by NASA and a newscast with uh, President Bill Clinton announcing uh, the discovery of micro fossils from Mars in this electron micrograph image of ALH 84001 and that feature in the center looks like a chain of bacterial cells uh, now that was uh, many years ago back in the 80s and we're still arguing about the announcement now uh, because the scale of this object is such that those uh, supposed fossilized cells are too small really to be bacterial cells they're uh, much smaller and probably wouldn't be able to contain enough genetic machinery um, but that doesn't mean they aren't and so you know, life has very clever tricks up its sleeve so we're just uh, still arguing about the provenance of that particular uh, result now here's a, an image taken by the Opportunity rover on Mars 
and you can see where the heat shield has come down and made a new crater and there's bits of the uh, material scattered about uh, the main part of the shield to the left another piece over to the uh, right of center and the big crater obviously but when they trundled up and took some more detailed photographs they zoomed in and saw this picture of the uh, heat shield and a couple of uh, large springs that had been used to eject it they looked to me like they'd come off the suspension of a triumph herald uh, but in the background there's something sitting behind the heat shield on the surface and it's a meteorite it's an iron meteorite sat on the surface of mars and i talked about this in my lecture the brief history of mars because it's evidence that mars once had an atmosphere sufficient to slow this meteor down to the point where it became a meteorite without vaporizing so it's bumped onto the ground at a couple of hundred miles an hour and probably bounced a few times, but come to rest there. Um, and it must have been slowed down from its hypervelocity uh, atmospheric entry by a thick, dense atmosphere. Mars's atmosphere today is too thin. So this is very strong evidence that once upon a time, the Martian climate was very different. But of course, the other thing that we see in the sky are comets. And here we've got a few of my favorites. We've got Hale Bopp, Lovejoy, uh, McNaught, and the close up on the bottom left of the uh, Chernimernov Gerasimenko, which is 67p for you and I for the rest of the evening. And that uh, was the one that was visited by the Rosetta mission. So, Comets are these dirty snowball or snowy dirt balls made of mixtures of stone and iron and a lot of ice and different ices, ammonia ice, methane ice, all mixed together, fairly loosely packed, frozen carbon dioxide mixed in there as well. And they travel around the solar system on their long orbits. And uh, when they come near the sun, the volatile material boils away and gives us these. Uh, marvelous tailed objects. Now Aristotle believed they were clouds of burning gas in the atmosphere, was trying to explain them that way, but of course we now know that they're well beyond the atmosphere, orbiting around the sun in their own right. That's a comet Lovejoy again there. But a, the most famous comet is Halley's Comet, and here's a record of its appearance in uh, the Bayer Tapestry from its 1066 apparition up in the top right and all the people there are pointing in wonder from their castle up at the uh, comet thinking it was an omen of uh, some sort good or bad depends on your point of view. Now obviously it was Edmund Halley that realized that comets orbit the sun and come back repeatedly and was able to figure out that one particular comet reappeared every 76 years and in fact this appearance was one of them and that's why it bears his name uh, and it reappeared in 1910 as well and the earth was predicted to take a very close pass and go through the tail of the comet and the uh, story on the right here from the news is of a French astronomer called Camille Flamir Flaminarian and he made the observation using a spectroscope, which is a fairly new science, and they noted the fact of the discovery of cyanogen, and that's a precursor to cyanide gas in the tail. And the first report here says that the uh, gas is liable to be, uh, affect the uh, terrestrial atmosphere, and the idea would not be absurd at all. Um, but uh, he then says that they're purely an optical phenomenon and nothing really to worry about. But the story soon got completely out of control. Comet's poisonous tail gets repeated and uh, it goes on in the text there about cyanogen being a very deadly poison, a grain of its potassium salt touched to the tongue, sufficient to cause instant death. In its uncombined state, a bluish gas similar to chlorine and very poisonous uh, smell of almonds and so on and uh, 
then at the bottom it says Professor Flammarion is of the opinion cyanogen gas would impregnate the atmosphere and possibly snuff out all life on the planet. So a proper doomsday prediction. Um, this goes on and is uh, then taken up by lots of other people. And of course the charlatans get in on the act selling uh, uh, quack cures. There's Pope's anti-comet pills there. And there were comets this and comet that, comet hats, comet uh, masks, all sorts of things being sold. But of course the comet arrived and a couple of very early photographs of the spectacular view of the tail here. But, well, we're all still here and nothing happened. The amount of material in the very dilute uh, cometary tail, not enough to do any harm at all to us here on Earth. And as I said, Halley was the one who worked out that these comets were objects in orbit around the solar system, some on long thin orbits, like uh, the, the one shown at the bottom there with a 17,000 year orbit, Halley with 76 year orbit, others uh, much shorter orbits almost in the inner part of the solar system. But some of them come from a very, very long way out, out from beyond the Kuiper belt, beyond Pluto, um, or even out to the Oort cloud, taking millions of years to do a complete orbit, or indeed uh, come in on hyperbolic trajectories and pass the sun and never come back. We've certainly seen one case of that recently. So 1997, there was Hale-Bopp, two thirds of the world's population saw it. It's a marvellous photograph of it in the sky with its uh, blue ion tail and its dust tail. And it's the largest uh, nucleus of any comets that we know of. Probably quite a beast of a, an object. So it's going to last a very long time, even though material is blasted off it every uh, time it comes past the sun. Here's a high resolution picture showing the two tails, the ion tail being deflected away by the magnetic field and the dust tail following along uh, behind the comet along its trajectory and being blown by the solar wind away from the sun. Now this particular one, Hale Bob, uh, the previous visits to the one that uh, I saw was in 2215 BC and you want the next one, you're going to have to live till the year 4385. It really is on a very long orbit indeed. A few years ago we had Mac Nort. This was a photograph of it from Britain, so quite a nice little comet up there in the sky in the twilight, pointing down towards where the sun has set. But after it had passed by the sun, it had developed the most magnificent tail in this photograph from Perth, Australia, where it's filling the sky almost with its uh, tail, showing multiple eruptions of material. Here's a little animation of a comet detected by a spacecraft coming in and swinging around the sun and the solar wind and uh, irregular eruptions of material from the sun there. The little black disc has blotted out the sun. Here we go again in uh, a zoomed in version. Here comes the comet and you can see the tail points away from the sun and it swings past and the tail swings round and points away out in the opposite direction. A little difficult because it's in 3D, of course. But there's a great link between tonight's event of a meteor shower that happens regularly every time we get to the 11th, 12th of August. We see a lot of uh, meteors coming in from one particular direction called the radiant. Um, and this is very similar to driving in a car into a snowstorm. You'll see all the snow particles coming at you like uh, they were radiating from a point ahead of you. But it's just a, the effect of perspective. And what's happening is the Earth is traveling towards that direction of the radiance. That is the bow shock of the Earth as it passes through a intersection with the comet's tail from a previous pass of a comet. And so for tonight, the uh, radiant will be in the constellation of Perseus, 
which will be uh, up round to the east, a little bit north, um, later on tonight, uh, rising, get a better apposition of it after midnight. Um, but the meteors will streak right over the whole sky, and usually the Perseids are very reliable for giving quite a good show. And so with the sky being clear tonight, I'm very keen to be able to observe them later on. I've said that what they are, are fragments of a comet, where the comet's orbit intersects with the Earth's orbit. And for this particular comet, it happens twice, uh, once uh, this time of year and another one at another time of year. And that's quite common. We often get pairs of meteor showers. So the comet concerned here is Comet Swift-Tuttle, and it orbits the sun every 133 years, which takes it out into the Kuiper belt, beyond Neptune, beyond Pluto, and then swings back in and dives through the inner solar system, crossing the Earth's orbit. Now, this is, uh, again, a sort of diagram of the Earth sweeping through the cometary dust left from previous passes of the comet. You don't need the comet to be nearby to get the meteor shower. And uh, in 1992, when it, uh, the comet came to perihelion, it uh, was visible to uh, pairs of binoculars, um, but it's not going to be visible this time. It's a long way out. The Can you keep the going to be in the inner solar system. It's going to be 21, 26. Hi. Sorry, can you mute your microphone, please? I can hear chat chat in the background. Thank you. So, if you're around in 2026, 20, then uh, we'll uh, 2126, then we might be able to see it again. Twenty-three million kilometres. That's not a close pass, but uh, it should be quite bright. But I'm not sure I should be around in twenty-one twenty-six to see that. But Swift Tuttle um, is very important because it has been described as the most dangerous object known. Uh, originally, the twenty-one twenty-six pass looked like it was going to be much closer, but uh, the nineteen ninety-two pass. The data from that revealed that it was going to miss us, as I said, by 23 million kilometres. But in the year 3044, there's going to be a close approach of 1 million kilometres or less. And in the very long term, the orbit is gradually going to change due to perturbations by the uh, planets. And it's uh, got a 1 in 50 million chance that it will collide with the Earth at some point. Um, in the next few tens of passes. So it's uh, one that we really have to watch out for. If it did hit, it would be 30 times the impact energy of the Chicxulub impact that wiped out the dinosaurs. And so this is possibly uh, capable of wiping out all life on Earth, and hence the most dangerous object known. And if you don't think that uh, comets and meteors smash into planets, well, they do, because we had the end of the world star party, rather jokingly, uh, in 1992, when comet Schumacher-Levy 9 hit Jupiter. And that was the first of our real successful public observing evenings, where we put a camera into the telescope to let everybody look at once. And that's what we're going to do this evening as well. And there's an image of uh, the comet having been shredded by the previous pass, and then the impacts on Jupiter later, creating those enormous smoke rings. You bear in mind, each one of those is the size of the Earth. We also get quite a few shredded comets crashing into other objects. Here's Ganymede, the largest moon of Jupiter, largest moon in the solar system, in fact, and some crater chains, which are the remains of shredded comets that have crashed down upon it. And we also get those, see those on the moon and even some on the Earth that we've discovered. Another famous 
event on Earth was the 1908 Tunguska event in Siberia, rather like the Chelyabinsk. It was an airburst, but this one was 10 to 15 million tons of TNT, so 20 to 30 times the energy, and it laid waste to thousands of square kilometers of forest. Here's a picture taken of the trees which were mostly flattened and laid a pointing away from the epicenter. And then we've got a diagram of the blast direction underneath ground zero below the point of the explosion. And then there's this curious lake, Lake Checo, which looks like it might be the uh, impact crater filled with water for a large fragment at least that may have come in um, and uh, actually made it to the ground, but still not sure about that. Even recent expeditions reveal the regrowth of the younger trees, but the trees being laid out flat from the original event. And there's the Davy crater chain on the moon there, and a number of craters that all happen to have the same date and are pretty much in a straight line laid out across the United States, across three states there, Avon, Crooked Creek, Hazel Green, and so on, all date to the same age. So they're probably the result of a shredded comet smashing into the earth. Now I mentioned the Chicxulub crater, and that was the uh, event 65, 66, probably more accurate figure these days, uh, a million years ago a large object smashed into the end of the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico and created a crater 200 kilometers across. Uh, in the process, throwing material, molten material, right up high into the atmosphere to rain down all over the earth and caused uh, global forest fires and all sorts of mayhem and disaster, tsunamis all across the uh, Western and southern states of the United States have been tracked to this event and layers of iridium all over the, the earth from the incoming impactor, uh, an element that's very common in iron meteorites but very rare indeed in uh, uh, the earth's crust. So very good strong evidence of the impact. And of course that took out the dinosaurs and it's not the only event if you listen to my talk about uh, death from the skies, there have been many substantial impact events that are coincident with uh, mass extinctions. They may not have been the only trigger for the mass extinctions, but they may have been the final killer punch that uh, sent a bad situation into a terminal one for much of the life at various intervals. So do look at my uh, video called Death from Above, or indeed the uh, companion to that, which is called um, the Snowball Earth, worth looking at. Now going right back to the beginning of the Earth, of course, it's just like the planetesimals we were talking about, formed by accretion of objects in falling, and would have been a molten ball of uh, liquid rock with a molten iron core before it started to cool down. And it would only have been allowed to do that once the uh, infalling material slackened off a little. And so the rather curious thing is that it would have had a molten crust at hundreds of degrees centigrade, so hot that liquid water could not have remained on the ground and would have been boiled into space. Now that uh, liquid water would have, uh, of course, uh, boiled away and we still have oceans so there's a bit of a mystery as to where we got the water to make those oceans if it was all boiled off early on and the answer is probably that it came from comets uh, but there is a bit of a puzzle to this because again we use isotope signatures and we can look at the heavy isotope of hydrogen called deuterium, it's got an extra neutron in its uh, nucleus, and we can measure the proportion of that in the Earth's oceans. We find it's got 165 parts per million. Um, we look at comet Hale-Bopp and find it has 200, 
and Comet 67P 450. So uh, we've looked at a number of other comets as well. Whereas if you look at Jupiter, I think it's 25 parts per million, much less. And that's much more the signature of primordial material. So somehow the isotope ratio on Earth gets enriched and also on these other objects. Well, I think what is happening to mess with the figures is that the lighter isotope of hydrogen preferentially escapes from Earth or preferentially boils away from the uh, comets as they pass the sun. And so gradually, uh, the more passes of the sun they have taken and the more time they have spent in a hot environment, the uh, less light hydrogen to heavy hydrogen they have retained. And that makes sense because Comet 67P is on an inner solar system orbit so it never travels a very long way away from the sun and regularly visits the inner regions and gets heated and so suffers lots and lots of heating events over time and has probably accounts for a very high proportion of deuterium whereas hale bopp that is a fairly infrequent visitor um, has only passed the sun a small number of times in all of its existence by comparison and has therefore lost less of the volatile uh, hydrogen compared to deuterium in those episodes. Earth, of course, is fairly warm all the time by comparison, but it has very strong gravity and so it tends to not lose very much of the hydrogen to space anyway. And so you have to factor all of those things in and it makes it really quite complicated to really be sure about the provenance of the water. Um, but we're pretty sure it must have been delivered by bombardment from comets. So cometary bombardment, not always a bad thing. Now there's some other asteroids out there that we're a little bit worried about in terms of collisions. Um, asteroid Apophis is possibly the most dangerous and that's uh, 370 meters along its long axis. So it's not that big it's not the 20 kilometers of uh, Swift Tuttle or the uh, some of the other very large objects um, but it's still 60 million tons of material moving at uh, tens of kilometers per second would create a very loud bang if it crashed into us and here's its orbit it uh, has a perilously close orbit to that of the earth and crosses it twice and crosses with Venus as well, so the chance it might collide with either the Earth or Venus at some point in the future. Now in just nine years time, Apophis is going to pass by the Earth closer than our geostationary satellites, our communication satellites in the Clark Belt, that means they have an orbital period of exactly 24 hours and therefore stay put in the sky. Um, we use them for things like Sky TV. That's 22,400 miles above the Earth. And Apophis is going to pass closer than that. How close? Well, we're never entirely sure because uh, the influence of the solar wind and gravitational perturbations from other objects always give these things a certain margin for error. But it's only nine years away and we're fairly confident it's going to miss. When it does miss, that's good, and we'll be able to refine its orbit for the next pass. Because the pass after that is not that long in the future, April the 13th, 2036. And it had been predicted that it was going to actually collide. But the latest refinements to the orbit look like a nice wide miss. It uh, got perturbed on the previous pass. so. Uh, we're looking like we're safe probably for several hundred or thousand years now, looking into the future, but it's a bit of an uncertain prediction. Also worth noting is uh, Comet Temple One here, uh, talking of impacts, because here we created an impact. We sent a space mission called Deep Impact out to meet it. 
um, there's a lovely photograph of it and a picture even of the nucleus there taken by deep impact. We can see a little story that in 1881, Temple One passed close to Jupiter and had its orbit perturbed so far, far off course that astronomers lost track of it till 1967 when it was recovered and calculations were able to work out what had happened. 80 billion tons, that would be bad if that came our way. But uh, the collision that did happen was with the deep impact space mission, flew up close to the comet, tracking along beside it, and then dropped the large copper impactor weighing 370 kilograms that smashed into the uh, nucleus of the comet. In fact, it kind of placed it in front of the comet and let the comet run it over. But it was an impact explosion with five tons of TNT. And the uh, probe was then able to watch the explosion shown on the right and study all the ejected material. So we got quite a good study of some material directly from deeper within the nucleus of this uh, Comet Temple One. We've also got, though, interestingly, some fragments of the asteroid Vesta, second largest asteroid out there in the asteroid belt. Almost a dwarf planet, but not quite. It's 500 kilometers across, so large enough to have undergone that differentiation process with a mel melted core, um, but not quite large enough to have pulled itself into a, a, a very uh, good spherical shape. It's rather flattened and a bit sort of uh, uh, irregular. And there's an image there taken by the Dawn space probe that went and orbited around it for a while. And interestingly, around about 5% of the meteorites on Earth are from Vesta, we think, based on, again, spectroscopic studies of the material. Because when you look at Vesta from the right angle, and there's a colour enhanced image down to the left there showing the structure, but you can see it highlighted, there is an enormous crater with a central peak on one hemisphere of Vesta. And that impact formed about a billion years ago and must have been almost large enough to completely destroy Vesta and disrupt it. And it's formed this enormous um, planetoid wide crater called the Rhea Silva crater. And it must have ejected enormous amounts of material um, and the HED class of meteorites come from this impact uh, and have landed on Earth. Here's some thin sections of each of them. The, the HED stands for Howardites, Eucrites and Diogenites. And they're different structure, different crystal structure when you look inside them. The Howardites are from the impact zone itself, the very shattered, long, thin crystals. The eucrites in the middle are from the crust and the diogenites were dug out right in the last stages of the, the impact and uh, thrown into space. And we've got examples of each of those. So it allows us to understand the different layers and different crystal structures within the asteroid Vesta without actually having to do a sample return mission. And uh, we're getting, coming to the end now with just a uh, Another interesting event that happened around about 13,000 years ago was called the Younger Dryas, when suddenly the climate went very cold. And you can see the graph of temperature from previous ice age, then warmed up at uh, points one through two, three, four, five, and then six is this cold period called the Younger Dryas event, and then warmed up again, and uh, then came along through the last 10,000 years uh, to where we are now, where uh, there's a little bit of an upswing uh, due to global warming uh, that we're all rather worried about and quite rightly because it's going changing very fast. But the event itself, the Younger Dryas, seems to be associated with an impact because there is a strewn field, an area covered in nano diamonds all over the zone of from Turkey through Europe and 
Mexico, the US and Canada, lots of sites with uh, imp multiple impacts and these uh, nano diamonds in a layer, which seems to correspond to the this timing. So it looks like an impact through a lot of dust and material up into the sky and effectively caused a uh, quite long nuclear winter style event where the climate was thrown into a very cold period. So now we are getting on to just tonight's other events. Um, the best night is probably tonight, followed by tomorrow night. And after 11 p.m., um, sometimes around 10.30, you start to see the meteors. You need it to be dark. So outside, deck chair, blanket, warming drink perhaps, perhaps with a little bit of alcohol in it if you're so inclined. Face towards the east, but you don't have to just focus on one part of the sky and you should see the meteors coming streaking over. So I'm very, very hopeful that I'm not uh, setting us all up for a giant fail in a couple of hours time. But uh, that's, uh, that's really the story of shooting stars and space rocks. So I'll bring that to an end. And as you can see, this is one of my lectures.